Oh, yeah, go for it. Hello. Loud. <laughs> All right, so our final panel is called Human Nature, and it's works exploring nature, but also human nature. <laughs> and first, we have Sophie Craig. Hi. I'm going to hold it. <laughs> um, so my name is Sophie and I come from um, Campbell Hall and our prompt was sort of to analyze through the eyes of several environmentalists and transcendentalists and naturalists sort of what they gather to be the value of nature and I answered that and then it gets very pessimistic at the end. Okay. So it's entitled, Way Out There in the Back of the Beyond, The Nearsighted Worship of Nature in Transcendental Literature. There exists a profound contrast between the decaying body of man and the endurance of the natural world. Nature is his crib, his deathbed, yet he is merely a guest in its house. Man cannot see into the future of nature. It is older than his records and larger than his predictions. It appears simplest in his eyes as everlasting. However, nature's limitless lifespan is a man-made construct. He sees its realm as outside of himself and dreams that he can live beyond his body if he could only send his memory there. If he could only leave an impression of his mind on a monument that does not dis expire like his body. He imposes continuity upon the world, the decay of which he cannot predict with near as much precision as his own. The value of nature in the eyes of man lies in its seeming immortality, a quality he covets and seeks out as a means of preserving his mortal body. So mankind looks upon nature as the museum in which his achievements stand on display. He assures himself that the foundation of nature will not tremble in the face of the human earthquake. Environmentalist Edward Abbey effectively puts the thought of natural preservation out of his mind as he focuses on his own. In his essay, The Great American Desert, Abbey describes his relationship with the natural world for what it is, a shamelessly parasitic symbiosis. His worship is devoid of respect as he saps its sacred, sacred strength to preserve, his own, to preserve himself. When I take on my next incarnation, my bones will remain bleaching nicely in some gulch under the rim of some faraway plateau way out there in the back of the beyond. Abbey instills an image into the mind of his reader of the desert as an endless blank canvas. He describes its horizon as the beyond, as the beyond, indicating not merely its physical breadth but its spiritual magnitude. He draws a connection between the vast unknown that is the American desert with the vast unknown that is the afterlife. To declare that he would throw his bones, a prevailing symbol of human mortality, into a symbol of immortality unnerves the reader, for it represents his rejection of the law of human impermanence. Abbey writes in a tone of utter conviction despite the inherent paradox of his statement. His desire that his memory remain bleaching in the desert, essentially settling into a state of fossilized permanence, while he transitions into his next incarnation, justifies the reader's concern. The idea that his life would be preserved in memory at the same time that he move on to another does not compute in the reader's mind and is thus his first clue that mankind's quest for immortality is not only infeasible but wrong. Mankind aches to resolve this discomfort of mortality, hoping that the seeming immortality of nature will spread to his body. Henry David Thoreau attempts to ease the creeping fear of oblivion in his novel Walden with a small oral history. Everyone has heard the story which has gone the rounds of New England, of a strong and beautiful bug which came out of the dry lead of an old table of apple tree wood, which had stood in a farmer's kitchen for nearly 60 years, heard gnawing out for several weeks, hatched perchance by the heat of an urn. Who does not feel his faith in a resurrection and immortality strengthened by hearing of this? Thoreau describes an ostensibly magical event in a matter-of-fact tone, as if it were widely accepted knowledge and therefore nonchalantly drives his belief into the conscience of his reader. The ancient egg, a life form that defied its bodily needs, represents immortality. 
The table made of wood stolen from nature and built by the human hand represents the human body. Nature bore its materials, yet just like mankind, it exists outside of the natural realm. Thoreau includes the story of the miracle due to its implications for mankind. A piece of natural immortality found its way into the mortal human body. It serves as a metaphor for his belief that nature's immortality can latch onto man's body and sustain it. He looks to nature, into the eye of a creature so much more mysterious and impressive than himself, and invents the answer he so desperately seeks. However, as Thoreau embellishes the meaning of an adaptive instinct, insect, an ancient tree becomes a kitchen table. As Abby looks into the beyond of the great American desert, a man puts up a billboard beside its great ravines. The signs of a fading natural strength appear everywhere, yet many men dare not look at them for fear of losing their own strength. In his wilderness letter, Wallace Stegner points to nature's mortal wounds, challenging those who find their muse within the natural world to register what they have done, or rather what they have failed to do. Something will, gone, will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed, if we permit the last virgin forest to be turned into comic books and plastic cigarette cases. Stegner describes nature as a preserving force, but he diverges from the beliefs of Abby by saying that humans are endangered by nature's fragility rather than sustained by its invincibility. He demands responsibility, dismantling the notion that nature is too powerful to falter under human influence. He suggests that nature's virgin forests are dwindling. Rather than eternize Abby's body as it lay on the plateau of nature's canvas, cured by the sun, Stegner summages, summons an image of eternal trash. Plastic cigarette cases are the true immortals. Their decay is not indeterminable, it is non-existent. Humans sap nature's strength, and rather than use it to sustain their bodies and their memories, they drain it from the source and therefore kill what they believe to be an undying force. Stegner places the death of nature on the horizon, splintering mankind's invention of natural immortality. Unable to accept the expiration date on his own skin, mankind looks outside of himself for preservation. The natural world attracts his eye with its impressive landscapes that appear to exist outside of time. He develops a love and admiration for its expanses, its power, its invented immortality he has convinced himself is real. However, the threads of his delusion are showing. His retreat into nature breaks the fabric of his belief system by increasing the mortality of himself and of the natural world. His continued pollution of nature stretching its wounds wider, proves to him that he has been lying to himself. For all of a sudden, nature appears more mortal than him. Thank you. Next. Good. Next, we have Michael Sullivan. Um, can you hear me? Is this good? I'm Michael Sullivan. I'm from Loyola High School. I'm a senior. And for my presentation, I'm going to cover the short story, The Willows, by Algernon Blackwood. Uh -oh. Okay, so The Willows is a short horror story written in 1907. The plot is fairly simple. Two men who are traveling down the Danube River disembark on an island and begin to sense something is wrong the minute they get there. Eventually, they realize that the multitude of willow trees on the island possess an otherworldly power which they use to psychologically torment the men. After enduring the attacks for two days, the two men lose their rational capabilities and barely manage to escape the island before plunging into insanity. So a background on the author. Uh, Blackwood was an occult writer during the early 1900s, and he wrote The Willows in 1907. Like many other occult writers of the time, he was discontent with the propriety pro propriety of Vic Victorian Euro Europe and did not want to conform to the moral standards of the time. Thus, he and his fellow occultists were revived a neo-pagan tradition from the man romantic poets where they would look to find magical or medical metaphysical forces within nature. They often incorporated dark or eerie elements into their works as a retaliation against the acclaimed high moral, high moral society of Victorian Europe. And accordingly, many of his stories involve characters witnessing a supernatural force when they are immersed within nature the willows being no exception. 
Uh, here are two illustrations that accompany some of his short stories. He did not draw them himself, but they really show the kind of gothic and horror elements that he placed within his stories. So naturalism was a literary movement to which black would belong, and it began in the latter half of the 19th century, and it found its or origins in Darwinism. Specifically interested in how nature shaped man's character, the naturalist movement held life to be a competitive struggle where the fittest survived, oftentimes letting the supernatural forces of nature compete and clash with mankind. Naturalists, naturalists held the belief that our universe was indifferent towards man's survival. In the willows, the psycho psychological attacks of the trees not only influence man's actions, but nearly kill them. And we'll see a quote here from the scholar uh, Mary Papke. In a naturalist work, terrible things must happen to the characters of the naturalistic tale. They must be twisted from the ordinary, wrenched out from the quiet, uneventful round of everyday life. And Blackwood and his fellow occultists also utilized Gothic elements in their writing. They were interested in placing the twisted and sinister nature of Gothic literature into their writings, once again to contrast the morality of Victorian Europe. Characteristics of Gothic literature include psychological isolation, evil paranormal forces, the use of setting as a symbolically significant, and the use of setting as a symbolic, sim, symbolically significant space. In the willow specifically, we see the men uh, isolated on the island and the malevolent forces of the willow trees, an element of the island setting, as hostile to the two men. And a quote from scholar Mark DeSico, the deviant Gothic body, body that has been influenced by occult science is subject to a monstrosity that is not always immediately visible, but lurks beneath the surface. And uh, here we'll see some textual evidence within the story of n uh, nature's uh, paranormal power. No mere scenery could have produced such an effect. There was something more here, something to alarm. The very atmosphere had proved itself a magnifying medium to distort every indication. And with this multitude of willows, however, it was something far different, I felt. Some essence emanated from them that besieged the heart. So we can see how the willow trees here create an atmosphere that the men could feel internally but not necessarily see. It was the atmosphere that, that affected them. And if we look at this quote here, we see how uh, specifically the malevolent paranormal forces manifest directly within the willow trees. While other aspects of nature on the island have supernatural qualities, earlier in the story the island was described as a kingdom of uh, magic and the river was described as being alive, the willows are the hostile paranormal forces. And the quote, the willows connected the subtly with my malaise, attacking the mind insidiously, somehow by reason of their vast numbers, in contriving in some way or other to represent to the imagination a new and mighty power, a power moreover not altogether friendly to us. And as the attacks of the willows continue, the men lose their rational capabilities, and this is due to the fact that the supernatural forces transcend the limits of the earthly universe, and these men, constrained to the natural laws of the universe, cannot com comprehend the powers of the willows through an earthly mind. One of them uh, even hallucinates and sees non-human spiritual entities rising into the sky, unable to differentiate reality from an illusion. However, uh, Blackwood implicitly reveals one of his own occult truths here in these quotes. It is, que it is a question wholly of the mind, and the less we think about them, the better our chance of escape. Above all, don't think. And our thoughts make spirals in their world. We must keep them out of our minds at all costs if possible. To defend themselves against the attacks, the men must stop thinking. Thus, Blackwood reveals that to him, the mystical forces of nature hold dominance over reason. Only by turning to the irrational nature instead of thinking can the men survive, upending the cult Western cultural emphasis on logic and deductive reasoning. In Blackwood's work, the fantastical forces of the occult, neo-pagan nature, and the paranormal hold sway over the rational mind. And not only did Blackwood find nature's supernatural power to triumph over logic, but he also worshipped this power religiously. Much like the romantic poets, he would immerse himself in nature and look there to find higher spiritual truths. He essentially attempted to expand his consciousness through the veneration of uh, primal natural forces. And if we look at the quote here, I felt in the human voice, always rather absurd amid the roar of the elements, now carried with it something almost illegitimate. 
It was like talking out loud in church or in some place where it was not lawful, perhaps not quite safe to be overheard. Once, um, by comparing the atmosphere to a church, uh, Blackwood reveals how we saw this natural setting of nature to be divine. And moreover, the men, experienced an intri- uh, the men themselves experienced an intri- intrinsic and unexplainable desire to worship the trees despite the fact that these trees drove them nearly to insanity. Uh, if we look at the quote here, it says, These things I knew were real and proved that my senses were acting normally, yet the figures still rose from earth to heaven, silent, majestically, and a great spile of grace and strength that overwhelmed me at length with a genuine deep emotion of worship. I felt that I must fall down and worship. Absolutely worship. And uh, we see how these neo-pagan uh, impulses are placed into the text through this quote. And uh, finally, these unorthodox religious impulses shed light on the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn that existed in the late 1800s and early 1900s to which black would belong. Intellectuals, artists, and writers from across Britain who were discontent with Victorian England joined the movement. They were upset with the superficial materialism and intellectual propriety of Victorian culture and its failure to recognize the spiritual, often mystical, motivators in human existence. And another quote from uh, scholar Mark DeSico about the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. He says, and yet concurrent with this trend towards the material, by the late 19th century, an array of mental and physical oddities, such as Theosophism, hypnotism, clairvoyance, spiritualism, and other occult phenomena helped convince a significant number of Victorian intellectuals and even a greater number of nameless artists that Enlightenment philosophies had been too hasty in dismissing the miracles and prodigies of old as fable and hearsay. And we can see here how the Golden Dawn members found meaning in their lives when they looked beyond conventional society and sought a reality that transcended the rational scope of human perception. And a final quote uh, from Blackwood to end. Adventures come to the adventurous, and mysterious things fall to those. To, uh, and mysterious things fall in the way of those who, with wonder and imagination, are on watch for them. But the majority of people go past the doors that are half ajar, thinking them closed, and fail to notice the faint stirrings of the great current that hangs ever in the form of appearances between them and the world of causes behind. Thank you. All right, next we have Greta Gooding on Daddy Issues. Hi, um, I'm Greta. I go to Windward. I wanted to start off by saying how humbled I am to be among these amazing writers today. I've heard some really amazing ideas that have inspired me a lot. Um, So I'm going to be talking a little bit about sex, but like weird sex. Um, (laughs) So... Um, Let me start off by introducing you to my friend, Sigmund Freud. Um, (laughs) Freud developed the field of psychoanalysis, which heavily focused on human sexuality, uh, which he claimed could be traced from childhood infancy. He also formulated the analysis of dreams, which we all associate now with a therapist lying on a couch, um, I mean, a person lying on a couch, uh, recounting their dreams to a therapist. Many of Freud's theories are not widely regarded today as the truth among psychologists, um, but we can still use them to look at literature and find new ideas and concepts. So you don't necessarily have to think that Freud's ideas are legitimate or applicable, but when we read with the psychoanalytic lens, we can find new meanings in, in like, you know, books like Hamlet that have been read over and over again. Um, yeah. So... I have examined how the work exhibits Freud's most well-known theory, the Oedipus Complex, which is described by scholars as the children's need for their parents and the conflict that arises as children mature and realize that they are not the absolute focus of their mother's attention. It is derived from the ancient Greek myth in which a, lo- in which a long-lost prince, Oedipus, kills his father and marries his mother by accident. This psychological phenomenon manifests differently in boys and girls. In girls, it is known as the Electra Complex, which functions mainly in the same way as the Oedipus Complex, but with the father instead of the mother as the object of desire. That's where it gets weird. Um, The Oedipus and Electra's neuroses are especially pertinent in the play as two of the main characters go mad after the loss of a parent. 
the manifestations of Hamlet's madness are well theorized by Freud himself. That's kind of how he came up with his idea of the Oedipus complex. Um, but most scholars lack a lot of evidence that supports, like textual evidence that supports the claim. Um, and they neglect the other insanity that happens in the play, the first insanity, which is Ophelia's. Um, essentially, for both of these characters, the repression of unacceptable sexual desires leads to severe mental derangement. Freud and his contemporaries argue that Hamlet's overpowering madness is a result of the Oedipus complex, but they don't talk about the uh, they don't talk about the Electra complex, and they don't give enough evidence. The Oedipus complex is the phenomenon in which the earliest inf infantile desires of the boy are directed upon the mother. As he ages, the boy begins to see the father as a rival for his mother's affection, and this anger often results in subconscious death wishes towards the father. Because these desires are widely known to be morally wrong, that's why I thought they were kind of gross, um, the boy is forced to repress these wishes into adulthood, which can produce trauma. Hamlet is understood by most to be grieving the loss of his father at the beginning of the play, but it's also likely that he is upset because his mother has married his uncle, thus making him king. He rarely expresses that he misses his father or is saddened by his death. Instead, he compl his complaints are of his mother's disregard of his father in favor of his uncle Claudius. The hasty nature of the marriage clearly troubles Hamlet more than his father's murder does, likely because of his relationship to the Oedipus complex. Since Hamlet's early realization of his budding desire to sexually possess his mother in childhood, he had been able to have more or less success, weaned him, with more or less success, weaned himself from her and to have fallen in love with Ophelia. His awareness that his beliefs were forbi forbidden caused a process of repress repression in which he seeks sexual fulfillment from someone other than his mother. Freud cites this process as completely normal and successful in most cases, citing, since our childhood succeeded in withdrawing our sexual impulses from our mothers and in forgetting our jealousy of our fathers, we recoil from the person from whom this primitive wish of our childhood has been fulfilled with all the force of the repression which these wishes have undergone in our minds since childhood. The text indicates that repression has taken its course, but not entirely successfully, as Hamlet <laughs> begins to exhibit outward signs of madness, as is cited by Freud. The long repressed desire to take his father's place in his mother's affection is stim stimulated to unconscious activity by the sight of someone usurping this place exactly as he himself had once longed to do. More, this someone was a member of the same family so that the actual usurpation further resembled the imaginary one in being incestuous incestuous, it's weird, I know, embarrassment, jealousy, and rage heightened for Hamlet, leading him into a frenzied madness, as you see. Um, his inability to further rep repress his attraction to his mother and his surmountation of trauma lead him into insanity. Okay, so if you've ever read Hamlet before in an academic setting, you've probably heard about what I've been talking about um, with the Oedipus complex. But the madness of the other main character in the play is rarely discussed. I'm talking about Ophelia. Strangely enough, Ophelia's madness develops after the death of her father, Polonius. Because the situation mirrors Hamlet's, it's highly probable that Ophelia's madness is due to the Electra complex. The Electra complex was theorized by Freud's contemporary, Carl Jung, who essentially finished the other half of Freud's Oedipus theory. The complex gets its name from the Greek myth in which Electra wanted her brother to avenge the death of the sibling's father, Agamemnon, sorry, by killing their mother, Clymenestra. Young maintained that a girl, like a boy, is originally attached to the mother figure. However, during the fa phallic stage uh, in childhood, when she discovers that she lacks a penis, she becomes libidinally attached to the father figure and imagines that she will become pregnant by him, all the while becoming more hostile towards her mother. Now I understand that this sounds far-fetched, but Ophelia is strangely dutiful to her father. Um, she follows his instructions to turn, return ha Hamlet's letters, remarking, but as you did command, I did repel his letters and denied his access to me, despite the possibility that Ophelia values Hamlet's friendship. At the time of her father's death, she is closer to fulfilling her pressed, repressed wish, but because he does die, she is forced to live with the regret of not um, attaining what she was so close to having. 
essentially the mixture of Ophelia's guilt for her repressed feelings and anger and jealousy of her mother leads her into insanity which rivals Hamlet's. Ophelia's madness is clearly a product of her father's death. Gertrude, who's Hamlet's mom, uh, reports that in the throes of Ophelia's madness, she speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks in the world and hems and beats her heart, spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. Her father's death has brought her a paranoid madness that makes her believe in conspiracy and brings a wealth of rage. As a struggle of the repressed mental processes to become conscious, Ophelia can no longer cope with the love that she has lost and the destruction she has brought upon her own life by following her father's wish wishes, which is ironic. She outwardly expresses that she has lost her reason because of her father's death before her suicide, lamenting, I would give you some violets, but they withered all away when my father died, just as Hamlet loses his intellectual prowess with the loss of his mother to a second marriage. Ultimately, Ophelia's regret for the shame she feels about her symptoms of the Electra complex leads to her subsequent downfall. Hamlet is one of the most discussed and debated works in regards to the psychoanalytic lens, partly because, to a certain extent, no one character in the play is entirely sane. An in-depth psychoanalysis could be done for every single one of the characters, or even for any work of literature, at least one character is known to be crazy. Freud's themes of Oedipal rage and obsession with death, dreams, and repression are all potent in the play. What Freud called the obscure legends which have been handed down to us from the primeval ages of human society and mythology and folklore, such as Hamlet, contain themes or elements that are often overlooked or misinterpreted, as is seen with Ophelia's Electra complex. Even still, the tropes that have long been explored, like Hamlet's Oedipal symptoms, could be still bolstered by new evidence and modes of thinking. Perhaps the play garners its an immense popularity for its insistence on lending more to the reader each time it is examined, even to expert critics. Though his depiction, through his depiction of many insane characters, Shakespeare makes a deeply resonant assertion that those who ignore what they truly desire will in always in some form be mad. Thank you. And lastly, we have Kat Oriole discussing cults. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Kind of to, I'm pretty short. I know, I need a step stool. Okay, I guess I'll stand on my tippy toes. Should I bring it down? There we go. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Kat. I'm a senior here at the Archer School for Girls, and today I'm gonna be presenting to you about my 20 page long paper for a senior seminar called Fear and Fiction and Film Honors. Yes, 20 pages long. Um, so it's called, Are We Going to Prom or Holy Hell? Cults are everywhere and you're probably in one. So let's begin. <laughs> Um, so, at some point in everybody's life, a parent or other adult will ask, if your friends jumped off a cliff, would you jump too? A teenager might reply with a witty or sarcastic remark such as, how high is a cliff? Or, yes, because then all my friends would be dead. <laughs> However, the general consensus is that the correct answer is no. Even if all your friends jump off a cliff, you're not supposed to qu consequenti consequentially <laughs> punch your death too. But for some, whether they like it or not, their answer will invariably be yes. This phenomenon known as groupthink occurs when a group of people makes faulty decisions because group pressures lead to deterioration of mental efficiency, reality testing, and moral judgment. Thoughtless conformity is a perilous mindset to take part in, but it be can be found everywhere. Cults are the extreme, most threatening example of groupthink, as leaders intentionally use psychologically manipulative schemes to control members' thoughts and actions. However, more subtle examples of groupthink are found in seemingly harmless but extremely <laughs> important societal institutions that share similar characteristics with cults. So in thinking about examples of cult-like behavior, High school and teenage relationships might not initially come to mind, but when analyzing and critically thinking about the hierarchies, bullies, cliques, and thoughtless conformity that exist in high schools, one might see that these four-year institutions closely resemble the structure of a cult. Um, so many people don't understand why people join cults in the first place, but they understand the way peer pressure allows high schoolers to be persuaded by those they trust. This relatable example helps people understand the inexplicable allure of cults. 
the, president, the presence of cult mentality in everyday life and why many people would answer yes, of course they would jump too. So in my essay, I drew parallels between the teen culture portrayed in the famous American black comedy 80s film Heathers to the infamous real life cults, the Buddhafield and Jonestown, as the movie mirrors essential cult-like characteristics of those groups and others just like them. The comparisons between a high schooler and the popular crowd who falls in love with a mysterious bad boy and members of religious cult show that he, all humans are vulnerable to becoming a follower of something similar to the idea of a cult in everyday life. So a little background on Heathers. The film might not explicitly be about cults, but it captures the same experience of falling victim to cult-like groups. Heathers is a movie about four teenage girls in a popular clique, three of whom are named Heather. Our protagonist, Veronica, is the odd one out in her friend group and develops a love interest with a mysterious bad boy, JD. When she becomes tired of the main Heather, Heather Chandler, and the other Heather's behavior, she and JD begin to break off and revolt against everyone else, resul resulting in a few murders that they stage as suicides. So what do I mean exactly when I say the word cult? So by definition, a cult is a noun, and it's a group of people or a movement that has a collecti collect collective devotion to usually extreme ideology that is typically embodied by a charming leader. Cults want direct control over their members through their personal um, and family relationships, um, through their financial possessions and living arrangements, and people are either born into cults or are usually manipulated or forced into one. And the foundation of any successful cult is a charismatic but corrupt leader motivated by power, money, fame, attention, love, etc. And at so the two real-life cults that I analyzed were um, Jonestown and the Buddha Field. And at the height of this civil rights era, Jim Jones was the leader of the People's Temple of the Disci Disciples of Christ. And he forced more than 900 of his followers into committing a mass suicide via cyanide lace punch. You might be familiar with the term drinking the Kool-Aid. Well, that's where that comes from. And I also analyzed the documentary Holy Hell, which was directed by an ex-member of the Buddha Field um, group, um, Will Allen, which um, highlights the initially Los Angeles-based cult, um, which was l is led by an aspiring actor, Michelle Gomez, who changed his name um, to Andreas, and then Reiji, which means God King. And throughout the movie, the ex-members still refer to him as the teacher or the master. And in Heather's, we have Heather Chandler, the most popular girl in school. And as she tells Veronica, they all want me as a friend or a fuck. I'm worshipped at Westerberg, and I'm only a junior. But she is not <laughs> the only cult-like leader in the movie. There's also JD, who shares all of these same characteristics, but also uses Veronica's attraction to him as his to his advantage. So not just anyone can be a cult leader. What makes Jim Jones, Michelle Gomez, Heather Chandler, and JD so special that their followers would do anything, including commit suicide, isolate themselves from society, and bully other vulnerable students? These leaders and many others share distinct personality traits, such as being charismatic, narcissistic, manipulative, and sometimes physically attractive. So after a lot of research, I've compiled a list of steps to joining and becoming a member of a f or a follower of a cult or something similar. So welcome to the Circle of Cults, a step-by-step -step guide to starting your own cult. Note, mass suicide may or may not be included. <laughs> so step one, acquiring your target. Cult members are often anyone going through change in their life and are looking for answers to life's biggest questions. They want to find their true purpose, and leaders make them think that they can provide those answers for them. So in Heather's, Veronica serves as the perfect target because she has an overwhelming desire to belong, is very unassertive, and craves change and purpose in her life. From the beginning of the film, there's a separation between Veronica and the other Heathers. She doesn't really fit in. Um, the first obvious difference is that her name is Veronica, not Heather, like the other girls. But in the opening scene, Heather Chandler is wearing a red watch, her fingernails are painted red, and when the word Heather appears on screen, it is predictably in red. And Heather Duke is wearing green, and the third Heather wears yellow. Everything these girls do is their one assigned color, and everything they do, they do together. And by contrast, Veronica is seen wearing blue and darker colors. She dresses differently from the other girls. She never walks in unison with them, and she is attacked for being an individual. However, her desire to belong, especially to the most popular group in school, outweighs her desire to leave. In the next scene, Heather Chandler forces Veronica to forge a love note and slip it onto the lunch tray of a girl they refer to as Martha Dump Truck. 
Although Veronica tells Heather that she has nothing against the girl, but that she will think about it, Heather responds, don't think. Veronica's inability to defend and think for herself allows her to be manipulated. After Martha is humiliated in front of the whole cafeteria because of the note, Veronica is angry about what she has done, unlike the other Heathers who are laughing. In a vulnerable, unhappy state, um, JD catches Veronica's eye from the corner of the cafeteria. He gestur gestures to her as if to say, that's really uncool what they did, and she can't believe she just did it either. Veronica wafts off screen away from the group who are laughing, and Heather just reminds her how lucky she is to be a part of the group in the first place. And later, when Veronica walks over to JD and asks him about Heather's lunchtime poll, what he would do with the $5 million if the world was going to end in two days, um, during this initial reaction, he uses this as an opportunity to lure Veronica in, and for the first time in the movie, she seems happy. She seems already in love with him. And two jocks looking at them from across the room note that it seems like Veronica's into his act. So although Heather Chandler pulls her way, JD knows he has successfully acquired his target and started to gain her trust. And that leads us to step two, trust and love bombing. So JD continues to go out of his way to impress Okay, thanks. So JD goes out of his way to impress Veronica and to give her an overwhelming amount of love and attention to continue to build her trust. So after the two jocks, uh, after two jocks approach JD and attempt to scare and insult him with homosexual slurs, JD immediately pulls out a gun and shotguns are heard. The Heathers clarify in the next scene that the shots were blank. But while Heather Chandler thinks that the police should throw him in jail, Veronica defends him, claiming everything's okay, and jokes that all he really does was ruin two pairs of pants. Despite this red flag that JD might be a little crazy, Veronica is clearly already under his spell. He has done something she wis wishes she could do, assert his do dominance over bullies and stand up for himself. Veronica and JD begin to talk about his family to further gain her trust and by being honest with her, introduce her into his world. He knows that talking about the instability in his life is a way to appeal to her emotions since she can relate. Um, so this technique that JD uses on Veronica is called love bombing and that's frequently used in the cult recruiting process. It's a form of conditioning that is an attempt to influence a person us using attention and affection. It's a tactic manipulative people use and it's certainly a form of abuse. Um, so this brings us to our next step, step three, the answer. And so because of JD, Veronica is able to take a step back and think, what do I want my look, life to look like? And he appears to be the answer to her prayers. Um, so she begins to deprogram from the Heather's cult and transition into JD's influence. She writes in her diary, I want to kill. I understand that I must stop Heather. Tonight, let me dream of a world without Heather, a world where I am free. So the next step is the initiation ceremony. So JD forces Veronica to poison Heather to prove her loyalty to him and officially break free from her tyranny. So the next morning they sneak into her house and um, Veronica doesn't intend on killing her, but JD on the other hand wants to make Heather drink something poisonous like liquid drainer. So unintentionally Veronica accidentally gives her the liquid drainer and immediately she dies. So typically in cults, there's a ceremony members must perform in order to turn recruits into true members and prove their loyalty. And this scene is where the control over Veronica shifts from Heather to JD. Although she hated Heather, when she dies, Veronica is shocked and just says, I just killed my best friend. JD tells her, and your worst enemy, but she says, same difference. This constant love-hate relationship blurs the line between cult leaders as enemy and friend. So this scene from Heather's directly, directly acknowledges the real-life cult that I analyzed, Jonestown, which highlights the film's deeper meaning about high school cults direct comparison to cults. High school, yeah. <laughs> Unlike the people of Jonestown, Heather is forced to drink um, a poison beverage that she wasn't aware is poisoned. Um, and the Jonestown event has become shorthand for drinking the Kool-Aid, which is, means you're under the influence of groupthink. So the next step is guilt, fear, and abuse. So having this huge secret bonds them together and allows JD to keep Veronica with him out of fear and guilt. And just after Heather dies, Veronica begins to freak out and think, I can't believe this is my life, and JD tells her, well, at least you got what you wanted. And since the two of them don't want to be caught, they stage her murder as a suicide. And she, he continues to do this, and they murder two jocks who um, spread rumors that Veronica had sex with them. 
and Veronica, even though she, no, even though JD tells her that they're not actually going to kill them, um, they a actually do end up dying. And Veronica cries out that she is such an idiot. But JD tells her, "Look, you believed it because you wanted to believe it. Your true feelings were too icky, too gross for you to face." And he does this to make it seem like it was all her fault and all her idea, and that is what she asked for when in reality it wasn't. And that brings us to our next step, step six, questioning beliefs and deprogramming. Um, after realizing she had been lied to and fooled this whole time, JD's facade is broken. Veronica is no longer blinded and controlled by him. She acknowledges that she has no control over herself and writes in her diary, are we going to prom or hell? Showing that she is questioning her devotion and loving relationship with him. JD tries to tell her, but our way is the way. We scare people into not being assholes. But it is apparent that Veronica is no longer falling for his message that he's spreading. And before she gets up and leaves, she says, and to think there was a time I thought you were actually cool. And, but at this point, she's officially deprogrammed from his cult. And uh, Veronica attempts to make amends with friends she previously abandoned. And she tries to go back to her normal life before she ever met the Heathers or met JD. So my next step is mass suicide. Um, so when loyal followers begin to leave, like many other leaders, of course, JD would think mass suicide is his last result. So he begins the cult process anew with Heather Duke, um, trying to convince her that she can take on a role, that the role that Heather Chandler once played for the school, a strong leader. And he asks her to sign petitions for the school. And he doesn't, she doesn't realize that she is actually asking students to sign a suicide pact. Um, so in reality, JD is planning to blow everyone up in a pep rally in the gym. However, Veronica stops him, and when JD decides to kill himself outside the gym, Veronica is finally free from his control, and the whole cult structure in the film is destroyed. So the foundation of any cult is the leader, like I said, and when the foundation crumbles, the whole structure falls down. This a scene where Veronica and JD fight in the boiler room shows how quickly a cult leader and member's relationship can change when all trust is lost. And during, during that scene, JD's true motivations were for recruiting Veronica specifically and staging the suicides are revealed. He claims that he wanted to blow up the school because nobody loves him and that he believes that the only place different social types can get along is heaven. So compared to the beginning of the movie, Veronica finally stands up for herself and defeats her cult leader. And JD is shocked by this and says to Veronica, you have power, power I didn't think you ever had. And so this brings us to our last step. Now what? Back to reality. The last step for Veronica is to figure out how to go back to her life outside of cult as a changed and now free person, a step that isn't fully shown in the movie. This leaves the audience with the ability to interpret what Veronica might do with her newfound independence. After JD blows himself up and Veronica walks away, Heather Duke tells her that she looks like she just came back from hell, T tells her that she looks like she is hell, to which Veronica <laughs> responds, I just got back. Veronica grabs the red scrunchie and decides to proclaim herself as the new sheriff in town. So in conclusion, there are currently hundreds of thousands of cult members who thought they were immune from cults and still don't believe they're in one. They have fallen victim to the same process that Veronica, members of the Buddha Field, and Jonestown fell for. And Heather's is, is what is known as a cult classic, a film with a massive devoted following. It's pretty ironic that they call it this since the cult classic has more to do with cults than dedicated fans might realize. It's also ironic that the movie almost discouraging cult-like behavior has promoted cult-like behavior amongst its fans. <laughs> and the fact that the idea of fandom itself is c rather cult-like, it prompts the question, are cults really everywhere? So movies like Heather are essentially about the same thing. Anyone is susceptible to joining a cult, and there are examples of groupthink everywhere, but sometimes it comes in less obvious forms. Okay, so... Um, this message is especially relevant for teenagers who are embarking on a new stage in their lives as they are trying to find their purpose. Teenagers are especially susceptible to this because cult members are often described as idealistic. They are open to learning new things, which can lead people without integrity to taking advantage of them. People must be aware that no one is immune to this process, and we must be able to critically think and identify when a leader is acquiring them as a target and love bombing them. So I encourage you to always think deeply about any message anyone ever tells you and analyze the small or big cult-like behaviors in your own life. Cults are everywhere. In fact, if you analyze this interaction right now between me 
up here and you listening to me, isn't there something a bit cult-like about that? That's just something to think about. So I'll leave you with one more thought. According to ex-cult member Elizabeth Esther, if you are capable of falling in love, you are capable of joining a cult. So remember that the next time an adult asks if you would jump off a cliff because your friends did. Um, so if you can stay for like one to two minutes, we would love to ask these panelists just one to two questions. Um, anyone have one? Yeah. One sec. So do you guys think free will exists or do things like cults and psychological disorders overtake that and rid us of our agency? Um, I think to an extent, I think uh, it's very, I think we must be conscious of the fact that the environment we grew up in definitely affects the way we think. Um, I think that uh, growing up, say, even if we look at the United States now, where, where people grew up in, I guess, uh, affects kind of what they think uh, politically, economically, things like that. The culture that they're grown up in, the uh, ide ideologies of their parents really affect kids while their minds are developing at a young age. So I think to an extent, while we have the freedom to uh, rationally uh, choose between alternatives, the, the process, our thinking process, which shapes our decision, is, uh, uh, can be altered by external forces. I think we definitely have, well, that's loud. I think we definitely have the capacity for free will. A lot of it is just kind of fighting the guilt or the peer pressure or the, the, the cult that you may be in. Um, it's like, if you have the strength to fight that and you have the strength to take your, or make your own path, then you definitely have the capacity to have free will. But if you either, you either you want to and you find that it's right and proper for you to do a certain thing that a ton of other people are doing and you, you may appear to be a conformist or you may appear to have no free will. But if you're actively making that choice and fighting any form of guilt that you have to not make that choice, then you're employing free will. Um, I think that certain influences can reduce free will. Like, for example, Ophelia, she lived in a very oppressive society and environment. Um, and essentially, like, her madness outweighed her free will. Um, I mean, she expressed the ultimate free will in killing herself, which is terrible. But um, her society was so maddening that she couldn't exercise her free will in all the ways that she wanted to. Um, so, yeah. Like everyone else was saying, I think free will definitely does exist if you are able to look past the peer pressure and other things that exist. And what I didn't get to talk about in my presentation was that I think the reason why people join cults um, is because they are afraid. So the reason why they're not able to express their free will is because they're afraid of being alone, um, not following what everyone else is doing. a somewhat similar question for Kat um, and I because in cults that the followers can be pressured into performing atrocious acts like you said in Heather's um, Vic Vic Veronica mm -hmm. um, does take part in killing um, uh, Heather Chandler Heather, and yeah and I guess do you think that the regardless of the fact they were under influence, the followers should be held accountable because that kind of made me think about um, the Charles Manson yeah. murders and how even th those girls are still locked up in prison mm -hmm. or the ones that are still alive, um, yet they were under like dramatic influence. So I was just wondering if that Yeah, was that does make me think exactly like the Charles Manson case. I know a lot of the followers are be still being held accountable when th a lot of people ask that same question, like was it truly their fault? And I think that I, I would agree that it is sort of their fault that they um, are finally getting the motivation to do something that they wanted to do this whole entire time. And sometimes um, it comes out in extreme forms like killing someone else. But um, yeah, I think that the cult leaders kind of bring that out of them. 
Okay, unfortunately, we're at the end of our day. I want to say thank you to this panel. It was great. Much appreciated. Let's give another hand. Um, so quickly, you know, every Lit Ann conference is uh, kind of overwhelming at the end, like all the things that we've heard, and this one more than most. So I want to thank all the presenters, all the teachers. Um, have a lovely afternoon, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>